morning. Um, I am Sergei Tabachnikov. I am a member of scientific committee and uh, I'm in charge of uh, selection of junior researchers, you. Uh, very happy to have you here. And um, I will be uh, chair in the morning. So we start with a, a new format for uh, this event. It's called Spark Session. Uh, this will be three short presentations by laureates, 20 minutes each, uh, including questions and answers. Uh, and um, let me introduce the moderator, Tom Crawford. Uh, he uh, is a prominent uh, a popularizer of mathematics. Uh, he um, has public engagement lead at uh, Oxford University, and I recommend you to visit his website, uh, which uh, is called Tom Rocks Math, in one word. Tom, please. Good morning. Um, it's Tom Rocks Maths with an S and I am very proud of the S being British. <laughs> uh, though I'm sure Tom Rock's mouth would also work. Um, so the, as Alexi mentioned, the, the idea of this session is to have slightly faster paced, um, almost like TED style talks um, from the laureates. So um, hopefully I won't need to be too strict on the 20 minute uh, time limit, but uh, we'll, we'll see how that one goes. Um, so, and the idea actually was suggested by our first speaker, uh, which would be um, Raj Reddy, who um, was awarded uh, the Turing Award in 1994 uh, for his work on artificial intelligence. Um, and in my research in preparing for, for this moderation session, I discovered a video that's on YouTube um, with Raj featured from 1969. Um, so I'm sure this wasn't created for the purpose of YouTube, uh, but this does mean that Raj created a video on YouTube 10 years before the current uh, creators and founders of YouTube were even born, which as someone who makes YouTube videos, I think is pretty cool. Um, so Raj will be talking about speech to speech machine translation. Uh, so Raj, wherever you're hiding, yes, if you're ready, <laughs> please take the stage. Good morning. The reason you should pay attention to my talk is it will impact everybody on the planet. Everyone has had problems with language. I remember ending up in Japan in the Japanese-only conference, and I couldn't understand what they were saying. I could make a guess, perhaps. But in the future, no matter where you are and no matter who is talking, you should be able to understand it, and the way it happens are the technologies of speech-to-speech -speech machine translation. So today, my talk can, uh, is about literacy divide and language divide. It turns out about three billion people are either illiterate or semi-literate, and almost all of us are not, don't understand all the languages, maybe one or two or three, if you're a good European, may, maybe 10, but there are 80 other, 90 other languages that are spoken by 10 million people or more. And if you happen to end up in one of those countries, you are deprived of language, the, the language divide will hit you. So, uh, what I, my goal today is to say we already know how to do this, it's just a question of getting it done. And, um, and so I just want to explain uh, in my talk some historical background on these technologies and then kind of discuss what we need to do to go for forward. Next slide, please. So in the, there are about a billion people at the bottom of the pyramid that cannot read or write any language. They're illiterate. You, they can't even read their own, read and write their own language. And there are about three billion people who are what I would call semi-literate. That means they can read, but if you give them a newspaper article and say, read this article and tell me what it says, they can't explain. They can read each word perhaps, but the question of understanding doesn't come in. So that information technology 
that most of us take for granted and the tools uh, are not used by them and they make less than five dollars a day and it's a challenge next slide please so the literacy divide problem uh, primarily impacts people in the rural populations where sometimes there are no schools but even if there are schools that only go up to fifth grade in my, like in my case i would grew up in a village uh, i had to leave the village and my family at the age of nine because there was no school beyond that, right? And um, so um, the problem, if you can't read or write, is you cannot benefit from lots of things that we take for granted. You can't read newspapers, you can't use online marketplaces to find the lowest possible um, you know, uh, uh, products, costs, and high the broad range of products available to you, and we can't, you can't use many of the features of the smartphone, and you cannot use the encyclopedia like Wikipedia. I don't know about you, I go to Wikipedia at least 10 times a week, maybe more, and that means that I, even people that are educated need access to knowledge. If we need access to knowledge, somebody in a village probably needs 10 times more access to knowledge. And the question is, how do we get them there? Next slide, please. Language, like I said, uh, is a serious problem for all of us. Even if we speak English, if we end up in Japan in a conference where all, everybody is speaking Japanese, then you're out of luck. So, uh, so the question is, uh, I was thinking, it's, it's now technically possible. All of you can be listening to my talk in your language. It doesn't take very much. And we are waiting for the apps to come about so that every Apple iPhone will have this, just like it has messaging and mail and everything else. So I think we're at the tipping point. In the next five, 10 years, everybody will say, how did we live without these tools? It's like uh, the iPhone. Uh, it turns out that technologies as such um, that everybody, more than half of the population has the smartphones. The others don't, that don't have it want it desperately. I read a news article the other day that uh, there was a couple in Bihar in India that they sold their child to get enough money so that they can buy an iPhone. <laughs> so it is, it is, it is uh, the kind, of, and that's what we used to say long ago, that is, you must create uh, an environment where you would give up a meal so that you would have this technology of a laptop or a PC or something. The question is, what would cause that to happen? Next slide, please. So there are all kinds of things that you could do if you had speech-to-speech -speech translation. For example, you could watch a movie. You could watch a movie in any language, you know, French or German or whatever, uh, and it would be automatically translated to your language and uh, it's not very hard to imagine how that would happen, but it doesn't quite happen yet, right? And I've been wondering why it hasn't happened yet for at least 10 years, because the first demonstration of speech-to-speech -speech translation, I'll show you a video from Rick Rashid, is uh, around 2015. We could do it then, it was not as good, but in, today it's pretty good but it's only available for a few languages, a few business you know, important languages for which we have data. The remaining languages were out of luck. And uh, the more important, more interesting one was I saw a patent application in 1960s where this guy said, I have this great idea. I'll pick up the phone and speak in, you know, uh, Belgian or, and you'll be able to hear it in English. Translating phone. You can do that today. Absolutely no problem. But if we have two smartphones, I'm speaking, and it, it can be trans recognized and translated, and it would, you would hear it in your local language, in your preferred language. So, uh, next uh, slide, please. This is actually speaking English, getting translated to Chinese instantaneously. This technology is very promising. So there's a delay. 
We are not yet fast enough. It has to be real time. Break down the language barriers between people. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, we don't have time. It's only 20 minutes, so I'm going to skip through. We, we have been, um, European Union has been using the la speech to language uh, text translation for at least five years and maybe longer. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So, the, the speech to speech translator problem has these three major components recognition, translation, and synthesis. The recognition, uh, all of them have a long history. I'll kind of quickly give you a perspective on what happens for 60 years. We've been working on it for 60 years. Next slide, please. The first one I'll show short clips of several videos. And as you were saying, they're all on the YouTube in the, their full. 10 minute length, okay. Next slide, please. There's a sound that goes with it. Obviously, uh, we rehearsed this. Can you stop and make sure that At the Carnegie sound- Carnegie Mellon University. Keep going. That's me. 50 years ago. At Carnegie Mellon University, we have been working towards a system for speaking to computers. In this film, we will try to show the problems that arise in getting a computer to understand speech. We all know that a native speaker uses, unconsciously, his knowledge of the language, the environment, and the context in understanding a sentence. This knowledge includes the characteristics of the sounds, the stress and intonation patterns of speech, a dictionary of legal words, the grammatical structure of the language, the meaning of words and sentences, and the context of the conversation. To illustrate the problems of speech recognition by computers, let us examine the sentences we heard earlier and their inconsistencies with some of these sources of knowledge. Colorless paper packages crackle loudly. Colorless yellow ideas sleep furiously. Sleep rises dangerously young colors. Ben burada ne yaptığımı bilmiyorum. Now we'll try a different experiment. I'll say a sentence and you try and write down what you hear. In muddy ozar, in clay nanar, in pine tar is, in oak none is. These examples illustrate that the listener forces his own interpretation of what he hears and not necessarily what may have been intended by the speaker. In muddy are in clay non are. Because the subjects do not Next have the contextual please. framework. In 1971, I was a member of a group of scientists who proposed a five-year research effort towards the demonstration of a large vocabulary connected speech understanding system. Instead of setting vague objectives, we propose specific performance goals. The Harpy system, developed at Carnegie Mellon University, not only satisfies these goals, but exceeds some of the stated objectives. Harpy is all the more interesting because it is one of the few examples in artificial intelligence research of a five-year prediction that was, in fact, realized. <laughs> Next slide, please. Today I'll be demonstrating the Sphinx 2 speech recognition system developed at Carnegie Mellon University. It's a large vocabulary dictation system that can handle between 20 and 60,000 word dictionaries. It's a continuous speech recognition system, meaning you don't have to put spaces between individual words. And its models are built using statistical learning techniques. Let's look at a few examples. The system was developed at Carnegie Mellon University. As you can see, I'm speaking continuously, not putting spaces between words. Ford posted a third quarter profit of $25 million. So this was 
1995 technology. And basically, we've come a long way since then. And um, next slide, please. We're going to be demonstrating the Carnegie Mellon Air Travel Information System. This is a system designed to process spontaneous speech from users and respond by retrieving information from a database. Show flights from Pittsburgh to New York. Just JFK flights. I want to go to Denver and I want to leave from Pittsburgh and I want the cheapest flight. The user can be very verbose and very loose in the way they say things, and the, user, the system's still able to decode what it is that they want. It's also able to recover slide, from... Please. Turns out, unrehearsed spontaneous speech from open population is the hardest problem. We still don't have it right, but it's close. We're getting it in close. The language translation has also had a long history, and uh, right now, after 60 years, you know, using uh, Google is able to translate close to about 150 languages back and forth. You can go from any language to any language. I, we di I didn't think it would happen in my lifetime, but we are there, you know. Next slide, please. And the same is true with respect to synthesis. Next slide, please. The first deep synthesizer I had was almost unintelligible. But then I got a speech synthesizer, Stephen Hawking which was, was using for a, a CLAT synthesizer was done at MIT. Next clear. slide, please. Today, our synthesis technology is much better. It will sound exactly like you with your stress and intention. What happened? Next slide, please. Hi, everybody. Today, we are here to see how AI has been changing our lives. I've even been thinking of my new career after the book, and I found I fly tech hyperbrain. I hope that after after reading it was done <laughs> after the fact. But in order to produce speaker characteristics of everything, you know, like, sound like you, there's a lot of computation involved. You have to build the models of your vocal tract and um, uh, lots of other things. I don't have time to talk about it, but you'll be able to discover it. What I want to show you is we have all the technologies, recognition, translation, and synthesis, it's just a question of using the speech to speech. Now you might say, next slide, please. How on earth are you going to go from these technologies to a language divide problem or a literacy divide problem? I'm sure if each of you take about five minutes, you'll figure it out yourself. It's the, it is the next obvious step. If I can translate languages, if I want to listen to a movie, it, it ought to be possible, the, you know, my, I put my smartphone in front of the TV and it uh, listens to the thing, it translates it and then transmits back to me in my local language. So these, uh, these things have been obvious to those of us who are in the middle of the field for at least 10, 15 years, but it's not happened yet. It will happen. And uh, so there are a number of prerequisites in order for a person in a village to benefit from these technologies for literacy, they, they, there are these four Cs. They need connectivity. They need a computing device, like a smartphone. They need content. And finally, they need capacity building. They have to have the digital literacy and learning to learn skills that are missing right now. And uh, there has been an experiment in um, X Prizes. It's called Global Learning X Prize. And uh, what they did was they gave a $10 million grant for someone who will show within one year, give a, a tablet to a child in, 
in Swahili, speaking uh, in Swahili, who has never seen a computer before, doesn't even have power, no, and, and, and does not have anything, and now you have to kind of, they have to be able to learn by themselves how to use the tablet with no teacher and demonstrate that they have able to read, write, and act, uh, do arithmetic at the first grade level. And this prize was won about three, four years ago. You can find it if you type global learning X prize on Google, you'll find everything about it. But it was very interesting to see what they had to do. So if, if I'm a kid, I have given a tablet and I don't, haven't even ever seen one before. And it kind of, a little cartoon comes and plops up and says, talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. <laughs> and so, so it actually prompts. And how does it know that? Because it is using the sensors on the tablet to discover something, somebody is holding it or moving it, and that's good enough to get it activated. And then they used lots of technologies that are routinely used in game theory. Okay, anyway, I, I'm running out of time. So um, all I wanted to say is there are these prerequisites. Next slide, please. So what we need to do is we need a global mission. There are three billion people that are, have never seen a computer before or a tablet. They can't read or write, or if they can read, they can't use it very effectively. So what we need to do is educate them, and it looks like an impossible task. It is not, as, we, as it has been shown from the Global Learning X Prize. So I leave it to you to do the, take the next step. Thank you very much. Perfect. I think in, in the interest of moving swiftly on, we will uh, skip the questions for now, though I'm sure Raj would love to chat to any of you uh, afterwards during the coffee break about anything he's, he's mentioned there. Thank you very much. Um, so our, our second speaker um, this morning is uh, Yael Kalai, who was the recipient of the 2022 uh, ACM Prize in Computing for contributions to cryptography. Um, and again, when I was doing some, some research prior to this, uh, I discovered in a recent interview um, that Yael described herself as uh, a troublemaker. Um, and as somebody who teaches undergraduate students who can sometimes also be troublemakers, uh, I, I wish they would be even partly as successful and hardworking uh, as, as she clearly is. Um, so Yael will be talking about the evolution of proofs in computer science. Yael, thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. So uh, I'm going to talk today about some project that I've been involved in for many years. And uh, it's essentially what I want to tell you a little bit about the evolution of proofs in computer science. So, you know, as we've seen also in Raj's talk, you know, the way we used to do computations was more or less like this. You know, we had our little computer and there was everything kind of local on our device. And of course, times have changed quite drastically. And today, a lot of our computations are done remotely on possibly untrusted platforms. And this is due to many reasons, but basically mainly because of the abundance of very large scale computation and large amounts of data. Uh, for example, with the increasing popularity of blockchain technology, now we have huge amounts of data on these public ledgers, and even to verify a single transaction is a huge computational burden. So kind of this new reality brings with it a lot of computational ch or just challenges in general. And okay, the first one, of course, is economical challenges. How do we uh, deal with pricing and incentives and so on? Uh, second one, which is dear to my heart as a cryptographer, is that of privacy. How do we ensure that now our data, our computations, which are done elsewhere, are indeed private? Uh, but actually, the topic of this talk is not on privacy, but rather on integrity. 
Namely, how do we know that the computation that we get back from the platform is, is correct? So this is kind of uh, the topic of, of this talk and the motivation uh, for the question I study, which is that of verification. So what I want, I want here's my goal. My goal is given any computational task denoted by M, M is some function, some program, and given any input to this computational task, I want my, compu my platform to not only give me the output Y, but also to give me kind of a succinct proof that this output is correct. Now, what, what's the properties of this proof? First of all, you should be able to produce it. Okay, so if indeed, let's say the task, the computational task, indeed gives you Y within, let's say, time T, then we would like to have the guarantee that one can generate this succinct certificate or succinct proof in time, not too much overhead, you know, approximately T, maybe polynomial in T. And of course, the size of this certificate and the time to verify it needs to be much, much smaller than T. And of course, this is crucial because otherwise, if to verify it, it takes time T, then the verifier will, there's no point of using the untrusted pl the platform, I'll do it on my own. Okay, so it's very important that this kind of certificate or succinct proof is very short and easily verifiable. Okay, how about soundness? So by soundness, essentially what I want is, well, you can produce false proofs. Okay, so if Y is not the correct answer, then it should be impossible to generate a proof that verifies. Okay, so this is what we want. But unfortunately, we believe this is impossible. Okay, we don't believe that any computation has a kind of succinct witness or a succinct proof. But you know, cryptography is actually, the way I think about it, it's kind of an art of overcoming negative results. So, you know, we hit walls every time we try something. And cryptography is really about overcoming these walls. So the way we overcome this impossibility result is we add a little word there. We say, you know what, yeah, false proofs may exist or false certificates that are accepted may exist. But they should be really hard to find. So practically, it's impossible to find them or to generate them. Now, what do I mean really by practically it's impossible? Essentially what I mean, yeah, an adversary that tries to fake these proofs may succeed, but only if he breaks some really hard computational problem, some cryptographic problem, say he can factor really large numbers or other problems that we believe are very hard in cryptography. So this type of soundness what is what we call computational soundness, because it's not real soundness, it's a computational version. Now you may think, where, where does this kind of cryptographic assumption, where does it come in? I'm trying to prove, let's say, to prove to that it's some computation. Where am I hiding this assumption? So there is one additional ingredient that, ingredient that comes into play, and which is that we assume that both the prover who generates the succinct proof and the verifier, they both agree on some common reference string. And both this, the certificate and the verification depends on, on this string. Now you can see, wait, where, where did this string come from? So in practice, usually what this string is, is just a description of some hash function which is some function with some security cryptographic kind of properties. And we'll see that during the talk when I'll actually try to give you, to present a scheme, you'll see that this common random string is some, some hash function. Uh, but in general, it can be any string that's kind of honestly generated and agreed upon between the, you know, the verif verifier and the prover. Okay. So this kind of uh, primitive, this kind of primitive is what we call succinct, non-interactive, it's just kind of a certificate, argument. And an argument is just another word for kind of a computational proof. So it's like a proof, but not really, because you know, it's not a statistical proof. So we just call it an argument. Okay, and for short, it's called SNARG. I don't know if anyone, has, has anyone have heard of the term SNARG here? Oh, okay, we have a bunch. Okay, <laughs> great. So, okay, so let me actually get to the punchline. You know, after, you know, 
a lot of time working on it as a community, uh, we now can construct these snarks for actually any computation under standard cryptographic assumptions, which I put there in parentheses, but this is only for the cryptographers in the audience. So what I want to do in this talk is tell you a little bit about the journey kind of that we went through, to, or part, a small part of the journey that we went through when constructing these snarks. Okay, so the journey actually started in the mid 80s with this beautiful magical idea of zero knowledge proofs. So the goal here was to come up with proofs. This was not at all about succinctness, just come up with proofs that reveal no information about why kind of the theorem is true. Now, it was very soon after kind of they thought about it, uh, Goldbass and Mikali and Rakov thought about it, they realized, actually, this is impossible. Okay, why is it impossible? Any proof, if you write kind of a proof in some, you know, a bunch of mathematicians here, if you write a proof, that's information. You can verify it, maybe you can give it to someone else, maybe you can sell it. It's, it's some form of information. But as I said, cryptography is about overcoming uh, these negative results. And the way they overcome this uh, negative result is really beautiful, is actually by changing the model. So after kind of thousands of years where proofs were thought of, uh, you know, these kind of line by line verification, they said, let's consider a proof being an interactive process. So it's verifier dependent, it's a single verifier where the prover is talking to that verifier and trying to convince him that the theorem uh, is true. And moreover, this proof is probabilistic. The verifier tosses coins uh, when he generates kind of this proof. And of course, it's paramount that the prover does not know what kind of ver the verifier's questions ahead of time. Otherwise, you can kind of flatten it out to be non-interactive. So it's a probabilistically interactive proof. And the, uh, the properties are also probabilistic. Essentially, it says that if the prover is trying to prove a correct statement, let's say he's trying to prove membership in some language L, uh, if the statement is true, then the prover should accept, should output one, the verifier should accept, should output one with high probability, let's say two thirds. And if the theorem is false, if X is not in the language, so the theorem is false, then no, any cheating prover can convince the verifier to output one with probably at most, let's say one third. Now, these specific numbers have no significance. The most important thing is that there's a gap between kind of completeness and soundness because by repeating this, let's say, k times, you can get complete, and by repeating and taking majority, you can take kind of completeness uh, being very close to one and soundness being very close to zero by uh, simple kind of concentration bounds. So, <clears throat> so this is kind of, uh, what they, uh, the model they, they considered, and they indeed, uh, uh, Goldreich, Michali, and Wigderson uh, showed that any uh, theorem can be made zero knowledge. So any proof can be made zero knowledge. So it's a really a very celebrated result, but as I said, that's not the point of this talk. I'm not trying to hide anything. I just want succinct proofs. And interestingly, what was noted very soon after these proofs were, were uh, this model was uh, proposed, is that actually interactive proofs are much more powerful, they're much more efficient than classical proofs. And actually, let me give you an example. Consider, let's say I want to prove to you that the black player has a winning strategy in this board. Classically, I, I don't know how to do that. The only thing that comes to mind is to prove to you that no matter what the white player does, the black player has the response that no matter what the white player does, uh, and kind of to give you this exponential size proof. However, it turns out, this is by a celebrated result of Adi Shamir here, that one can generate an interactive proof for any computation where the time to verify grows only with the space required to do this computation. And often the space is very small. In many, many computations, the space is really just linear in the input size. So it shows that you can do uh, these uh, uh, proofs, kind of interactive proofs, very efficiently. If you have any computation that requires succinct space, 
you can convert it to a succinct interactive proof, to an interactive proof where the time to verify is succinct, is like the space. Okay, so now it seems like we made progress. We have succinct interactive proofs, at least for computation that requires succinct space. Uh, and it seems like all we need to do is now somehow get rid of the interaction somehow, because we want it non-interactive. But actually, there's another issue here. And the issue here is when these, this model was considered, nobody cared about the runtime of the prover. Somehow that wasn't, actually even, they called these prov this prover a Merlin, like a wizard, like he's all powerful. That was kind of, the focus was on efficiency of the verifier. And uh, indeed, in, in, in these protocols, the prover ran in a lo very long time, actually run in time two to the space squared. So it was a very, very inefficient pro uh, protocol. So in theory, it was beautiful, but there was no way one can implement this uh, protocol. So <clears throat> that's where kind of uh, I came into the picture, and we were thinking, this is such a nice technology, we should be able to use it. It's based on beautiful mathematical ideas, and we, we would like to use it. So this kind of brought us uh, to define this notion of what we call the doubly efficient interactive proof, where our goal now is, we, the focus was not only on verifier efficiency, which of course is paramount, is very important, but also the prover should not be all powerful, unbounded, okay? So our goal here was to construct a proof, let's say for a computation that requires time t, where the prover should not run in time much more than t. Okay, that was our goal. And ideally, the verifier also, of course, he needs to read the input, so, you know, he needs to read, uh, understand what's proven to him, but should not be much more than that. So that was uh, our goal. And what we managed to prove, what we managed to show, is that indeed there exists such a doubly efficient interactive proof but only for bounded depth computations where the verifier's runtime grows with the depth. So let me explain what, what I mean by these bounded depth computations. So think of the computation as like a circuit, you know, let's say with addition and multiplication gates, mat two, for, just for simplicity. So the depth is kind of the number of layers in, in this circuit. Now, let me give you a little bit of an idea. Why is it, why, why are interactive proofs helpful here? You know, I said interactive proofs are more powerful. Why? Why are they so powerful? Why are they helpful? So let me give you kind of a glimpse about kind of the idea, the intuition behind our doubly efficient interactive proof. Okay, so suppose there's a prover who tries to argue that the output is one. I want to catch him if he's cheating. That's my goal. Okay, what can I do? Well, I think I can do, I can ask them, you know what? Show me the two children. I can check that, you know, there's consistency, that the gate is satisfied. Okay. Now I can say, you know what? I'm gonna choose with probability half one of them. Let's say I chose the left one. And then, I'll, you know, with probability half I succeeded, so I'm happy. If I failed, if I, if, so, sorry. L suppose you're cheating. Then one of them is incorrect. Maybe I chose the right one, the incorrect one, in which case I'm gonna kind of, I made progress, I'm gonna catch you, so I'm happy. And then I tell you, you know, give me the two kids. If the father, if the parent was wrong, one of the kids is wrong. I'm gonna guess which one. And I'm gonna continue, continue, continue. If all my guesses were correct, if you were incorrect, then every time I choose the incorrect one, I, I'll catch you at the end. Because then, then I, I'll, I know the input and then I'll catch you. I'm like, ha, ah, see, it's incorrect. But what's the probability that I, you were incorrect and each time I got the incorrect path? It's like every time I choose probability half, it's like one over two to the depth. That's terrible. So that's not that great. And indeed, what we do actually, we do a similar idea, but on the encoded version of the circuit. So intuitively what we do, we take each layer of the circuit and we encode it using an error correcting code. And this code has the property that if you're incorrect somewhere in the layer, almost any point in the encoding now will be incorrect. And then there's some reduction protocol as we had before. You know that if you're incorrect on some layer, you're incorrect on the next layer, but now with very high probability. Before it was half, but by going to the encoding, we managed to ensure that if you're 
if, you, if the prover lies, then with very high probability, he'll lie on the next kind of uh, layer. And how this is done, of course, is much more complicated. Uh, it's not just, you know, you, ch you just do this simple check. You need to do this check over this encoding, and that, you know, I don't have time to tell you more about. But that's kind of the basic idea. Okay, so great, so we're happy. Uh, we have uh, this <clears throat> succinct uh, interactive protocols for at least for bounded depth, okay? I'm, by the way, I'm not gonna tell you how we get around the depth. We use kind of cryptography to get around it, to kind of squash the circuit to make it low depth, but I'm not gonna get into it in this talk. What I do wanna end with is, this is an interactive protocol. Actually, it's D-round, like for every, you know, we go from layer to layer. I promised you a non-interactive protocol. So how do I get to the non-interactive protocol? And the way I get to it is by a very, very beautiful uh, paradigm, which is what's called the fiat Shamir uh, heuristic, which is a general paradigm for eliminating interaction in protocols. So actually, let me try to explain to you what this heuristic is in one slide. It's really, really beautiful, and it's used all over the place in practice. Okay, so let me explain to you, let's say, on a three-message, a three-round protocol. So say I have a protocol alpha, beta, gamma, and I need one assumption, which is that the verifier's message is random, it's uniform. Indeed, the doubly efficient protocol that we have has this property. All the verifier's messages are just random. Okay. Now the idea is the way you convert it, the way you eliminate interaction, is you say to the prover, you know what? You compute alpha, beta, gamma, all three. But we will kind of tie your hands. And the way we'll tie your hands, you can't compute the verifier's message beta as you will, as you want. Rather, it has to be a hash, the, the function, the hash function H of the first message. Okay, so essentially, instead of kind of interacting with a verifier, you're interacting with a hash function. That's kind of the idea, but now you generate the alpha, beta, gamma on your own. So you give alpha, beta, gamma, the verifier checks that beta, the verifier's message, is indeed H of the first message, and that alpha, beta, gamma is accepting. So that's the, the heuristic, and now there's a question. So by doing that, I get my snarg for bounded depth, at least for bounded depth computations. Uh, and, but now there's a question, which is, is this heuristic sound? Is it secure? When we replace interaction by hash function, do we get security? And in practice, yes, it's used all over the place, and it works, never had problems. But you know, the question is, is it, is, you know, is it also secure in theory? Now in theory, practice and theory are the same, but in practice they're not the same, turns out. Okay, so I worked on this question really, really hard, especially because Adi Shamir here was my, actually my advisor, so I really wanted to impress him. I don't know, did I succeed? Uh, uh, so I really tried hard, but after trying for a really long time, actually we found a negative result actually showed there's a very contrived protocol. Nobody would use it. We actually construct it in a very contrived way, but for which this paradigm fails. So that was kind of, we were really upset. We're like, what do we do? But then we turned out that actually this protocol, we managed to prove that, it, that this heuristic is actually secure for a very large classes of natural protocol, and that includes the GKR protocol. The, the doubly efficient protocol. Okay, so let me just end because I'm out of time. So I just want to say that kind of this SNARG uh, journey was actually a very successful one for our community of theoretical uh, cryptographers because, uh, you know, it was implemented and deployed and now it's being standardized. So it's kind of a nice journey of kind of how theory interplayed with practice. Uh, and yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, so short and sweet. Our final uh, speaker is Alexi Efros, who was awarded the uh, 2016 ACM Prize in Computing uh, for his work on computer graphics and computer vision. Uh, and I found um, a BBC article from 2007, which described Alexi's work with the title, Photo Tool That Could Fix Bad Images, which I feel like may be a slight oversimplification. Um, but today, Alexi will be talking about um, some 
the importance of data visualization, I think. He changed the title last second. Anyway, Alexi, please. Uh, good morning. So um, let's drive right into this. Let us look at this uh, Monet painting hanging about a few hundred kilometers in Paris of uh, this 19th century train station, Gare Saint Lazare. Um, it's, I think it's very, very um, evocative. You can feel like you're at this uh, 19th century station and there's the hustle and the bustle and then there is this train, the steam engine is entering the station right at the viewer, kind of emerging in and it's, it's, it's really, I, I, I think it's very moving. But let's, let's focus in on the steam engine right here. The steam engine here, look at this. This is basically a splotch of paint. It, you know, there, where is the steam engine? You know, it's a, it's a, a penguin or maybe like a, a, you know, a bottle of champagne stuck in a cooler. Where, where is, you know, the steam engine is not in, in the brush strokes somehow. The steam engine really is in your head. And all of you guys are, are probably seeing a slightly different version of that steam engine can, can, uh, depending on, you know, which steam engine museum you went to as a child. Um, and, and this is because our brain is really good at filling in details. Here is a wonderful video by uh, my friend Antonio Toralba. This is Rob Fergus working in his office. And you, it, it, it's a very blurry video, but you have no problem kind of filling in the details and figuring out what he is doing, even though it's very blurry, and, right? In fact, you're so good, you're maybe a little bit too good, because here is Rob actually talking on his shoe. And... Um, and he is going to now, you know, work on his trash can there, and he's, uh, he's uh, listening to his Coke cans and check out uh, the stapler there, and uh, the printer is really a toaster, right? So the thing is, uh, to quote uh, a neuroscientist Moshe Barr, our perception relies on memory as much as it does on incoming information, which blurs the border between perception and cognition. Or, uh, as Lance Williams put it, mind is largely an emergent property of data. Okay? And the thing is that historically, we didn't really give data enough respect. So, if you are doing, you know, let's say machine learning in the olden days, or really any, any part of computer science, it's all about the algorithm. You know, you come up with a great new algorithmic idea and you're super excited and you work it for, for, for many months and then you want to publish a paper and then you say, oh yeah, I need to, I guess, do some experiments. So I, I need some features, I guess, and then maybe like a couple of days before the deadline, it's like, oh, I need to run on some data. Sure, okay, I'm gonna get some data, whatever, right? Uh, and I think this kind of cavalier attitude has really not served us well in the past. Um, for me, I'm, a, I'm my research in computer vision. Um, for me, the kind of the defining moment maybe actually came in the 90s. This was when I was in grad school, and this was really the first example of a computer vision system that was actually working. Uh, suddenly, phase detection. You know, it, it didn't work, and then boom, it suddenly started, suddenly started to work. In, in a couple of years, it was in every camera. And if you ask any computer uh, vision scientist what were the work that, that made it happen, everybody would tell you this Viola and Jones paper. If you took a computer vision class, you per probably have heard it. Actually, there were three papers came out around the same time that all three of them made really impressive improvements. They all essentially worked uh, uh, the same. Uh, Rally Baluji Kanadi was the first one, Schneider and Kanadi was the best performing one, and Viola and Joe's was the, the, the real time one. But the, the point is that our field actually remembers just, just Viola and Jones. And why is this? Well, I think it's because uh, Rally used, you know, boring features, it was just pixels, and the algorithm they used was this old school thing from the 80s called neural networks. Nobody was using that. So, you know, it didn't really, it didn't really click. And then Schneiderman and Kanadi, well, okay, the features were a little bit better, but the algorithm was naive based, oh, it's so naive, right? Viola and Jones, on the other hand, the algorithm was boosted cascades, and it's a beautiful algorithm. I still teach it in, machine, in my machine learning course. It's, it's a beautiful algorithm, but the thing is, it didn't really matter. 
it wasn't the, the, the features or the algorithm that made them work. It was a little known fact, even still little known in our community, that actually those three papers were the first papers that realized that to train a system, in addition to having lots of positive data, images with faces in them, you also needed negative data, images without the faces. And that actually was that what made it work. Uh, so I feel like there's a little bit of a kind of scientific narcissism here. You know, everything being equal, we prefer to credit our own cleverness, the algorithms, rather than crediting the data because, you know, data is just out there. It's not clever, right? It's, we just download it. And I think this, this, this might not be the right attitude. Um, there is a wonderful paper um, a few years ago called the unreasonable effectiveness of data, kind of following up from the unreasonable effectiveness of, of, of mathematics, uh, where the authors argued that, you know, while part of our world can be explained by elegant mathematics, in physics, chemistry, astronomy, um, some things just can't, you know, f uh, you know, psychology, genetics, economics, and AI. And, and, and this is because things that are kind of depending on evolution, they just have too much, too much entropy, too much craziness happens for, 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 for things to really be nice and succinct. And this is exactly where the magic of data comes in and, and saves the day. Um, because, you know, some things are just messy. For example, if you want to, you know, if you are in the computer graphics, you want to synthesize uh, this, this smog, uh, you know, that's actually pretty easy. You just plug in your parameters in the Navier-Stokes and you run a simulator and you have beautiful smoke and you put it in the movies and everybody's happy. But if you want to, let's say, synthesize the bark, the pattern of the bark of this tree, there is no, there is no succinct formula for this. I, you can, you know, there is a, perhaps, you can write one down with thousands of parameters, including the genome of the tree, you know, the location of the tree, whether there was a squirrel living in this tree, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But it's very, very different. In fact, even just defining what a tree is, is really, really hard. You can try to make up a definitions, for example, you know, uh, trunk uh, moving upward, you know, branching in the leaves. Um, but the problem is that, you know, there's plenty of trees that don't fit this definition and there is plenty of non-trees that do, yet, any three-year-old will be able to tell you a tree from a non-tree. Why? It's not because the, the three-year-old is using, uh, figured out a better definition. The three-year-old just learns directly from the data. The nice thing is we, we do have a lot of data and, and we are getting more and more of it. And so uh, with enough data, brain-dead lookup, what we call nearest neighbor algorithm in machine learning, basically just finding the closest thing in your, in your training set and just stealing the label, actually works surprisingly well. Um, Taralba, uh, uh, Ferguson, and, and Freeman uh, 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 um, a decade ago j decided what, how much data do, do you need, do you see as a, as a five-year-old child you know, over, over your lifetime? And they came up with a rough number of 80 million, which is actually not that much. And so they created this data set of 80 million images, and what they saw is that as you get more and more data, any new image that you're looking at can be very easily explained by very similar images from that data set. So you have just enough data that, you know, nothing really stands out anymore. Everything is, is, is something that you already seen, kind of this ultimate postmodernism. Uh, at the same time, we were also working on this similar problem, but from a different end, basically trying to filling in holes in images. Let's say you have an image, you don't want this foreground thing, you erase it in Photoshop, now you have a hole. How do you fill in the hole? Well, what we did is just download millions of images from the internet, find the closest one, some graphics magic, uh, voila. You know, or you can do another one, or you can do another one, and sometimes it doesn't quite work, but that's okay. Um, you don't, you know, if you don't like the development on your favorite beach, you can remove that. Um, so, you know, why does it work? Is it the algorithm? No, it's not the algorithm. It's, it's really the data. You know, when we started and we downloaded back in 2007, it was the biggest data set ever, 20,000 images, wow. The nearest neighbors, they weren't really that near. 
So we're kind of discouraged, and then it was Christmas break, so we said, you know, let's let the computer just keep downloading, uh, you know, uh, for, for a while longer. So we came back in January, and, uh, and we got two million images, and suddenly exactly the same algorithm. No change in algorithm. Just, just worked, okay? Just because we had enough data. And, you know, shortly after that, we also applied the same trick, uh, silly, simple idea to uh, image geolocalization. So given an image, the question is, where on earth was it taken? And again, just download lots of images, find the nearest neighbors to this new image, and have them vote with their GPS locations anywhere on Earth, and then see where the biggest peak is. And in this particular case, it worked. It's somewhere in uh, Utah National Park, um, and 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 it, it actually worked quite well. Interestingly, 15 years later, um, neural networks came onto the scene again, and some folks from Google decided to kind of follow up on our work to try to see what they can do with with a uh, neural network classifier uh, instead of nearest neighbor. And they performed much, much better, but you can see that they changed two things. From nearest neighbor, they went to a deep network, but also from six million image data set, they, got, they went to 91 million images. Luckily, I was a reviewer for this paper. So I asked them, well, what about doing an apples to apples comparison? And they did, and guess what it turned out that if you keep the amount of data constant, basically the humble nearest neighbor does as, as well as the fancy neural network from Google uh, in f some regimes actually beating it. Now, now, I'm not saying that you know, neural networks are just nearest neighbor, uh, and of course, neural networks are much, much more efficient, much faster, so I would, I'm not suggesting you to switch to nearest neighbor right now, but I think it's, it points to where the, where the where this magic is happening. And I think a lot of the magic is happening in the data rather than in the algorithm, okay? So the good news is we have really stupid algorithms plus lots of data is giving us this you know, unreasonable effectiveness. Now, the problem, of course, is that just kind of raw memorization or nearest neighbor methods, they have trouble with rare events, well, the so-called long tail of the distribution. Basically, the the things that happen very infrequently, uh, then the problem is that, you know, the, 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 the rare is actually common. So this long tail, it's actually most of, our, of the data. So this is a, this is a problem. And, and this is where the modern large models are really doing something really impressive. They're able to interpolate and compose uh, data from different places together to do something completely novel. And, and, and uh, models like DALI and Stable Diffusion and Imogen and Parti, et cetera, are, are doing uh, very impressive feats with it. For example, here is some very impressive compositionality. Uh, you know, you never seen a dolphin in a, in a spacesuit, uh, but yet, you know, the, the, the system is able to kind of combine information from different things together and compose together a picture like that. Okay? But, Again, are we really kind of pushing a little bit too much this narrative that's this beautiful, fancy, amazing algorithm? And maybe some language features and, oh yeah, there is also some data, but we're not gonna talk about this. Because I think we might be making the same mistake. Uh, here is some example of, of, of do, issuing the same uh, prompt to three generative systems based on completely different algorithms. The algorithms cannot be more different. And you could argue which one you like most, but I would say that all three are actually doing okay. Um, and, and the thing is, what, what we have seen is, uh, there is this um, a graph from my former student, Taysan Park, that shows that the quality of generated imagery is really mostly depends on the capacity of the model, not on the actual algorithm being used, but basically how many parameters there are in the model, because the number of parameters is really telling you how much data is it able to, 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 under, to, to capture and to, uh, to absorb, right? So the, not, the parameter count is directly, directly uh, connects to the amount of data that the system has. And basically what we're seeing is that it, you know, it's not about the algorithm, it's about, it's about the capacity of the system. Um, and, um, you know, 
we are able to see some really cool generated images, something like this, this green creature monster being generated. Uh, but what we have done in, in a paper that's going to be presented next week at, in, at ICCV in Paris um, is that we can actually figure out which real images influence the creation of this generated image from the training set. And what we find is that actually there is plenty of real images in the training data that is, you know, getting very close to that seemingly very novel generated image. So there is definitely getting enough of the influence from the training data that, you know, we shouldn't really ignore this. So to paraphrase uh, Arthur C. Clarke, interpolation in sufficiently high dimensional space might be indistinguishable from magic. Okay, so takeaways. If, if, you know, if you listen to this and you thought, oh, okay, there is, you know, there is, it's just about the data, there is no reason to do any work on algorithms. No, that is not true. Uh, data, large-scale data is, is, is absolutely necessary in my opinion, but it's not sufficient. There is still plenty of room for clever algorithms, for creativity, there is plenty of work for us to be done, but we need to learn to be humble and to give credit to the data. Thank you very much.